place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Mike Lab, And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beer is specially paired with their work. Today's guest is Kathy Murray. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on, welcome to episode number 64C is in Charlie with on um, Books and Brews. And uh, so what have you been doing this month, Laura? Um, what have you been yeah, doing? It's, yeah. I, I find it amazing that this is still this month. I got the first spider bite of my life, the first poisonous anything of my life. Oh. Um, because yeah, up in the north, nothing's poisonous. Um so we moved down south. I'm out there taking care of the rabbits. And all of a sudden I felt this, I oh. thought it was a muscle spasm, actually. I thought it was like one of those sharp muscle twinges. Right. And right. I got up to the house and I had this massive welt on my shoulder. Oh, and wow. I had also just found that my poor rabbit had chewed all the fur off her legs. So I'm in the car you know i have a rabbit in a cage and i'm texting all my homestead friends who know more than i do going who do i take care of first how serious is a spider oh, bite wow. Go to urgent care now leave the rabbit <laughs> oh wow that's scary it was rather a dramatic month but then we <laughs> what do we get you forgot what we got <laughs> Hot tub. Yeah, we got a hot so, tub. Yes, we have a wonderful hot tub downstairs out in the back. And uh, with our wonderful view, we get to just feast our eyes on the mountain while we sit in the hot tub. So, so you can't beat that, you know. Yeah, so uh, first hot tub I've ever had in my life. So it's kind of exciting. Oh, that but, is. Uh, yeah, have you done any reading? Uh, no. Not. <laughs> I guess. I, too much of work is just plain work and not enough reading. So I haven't done that. Well, I, I forgot to bring the book to hold up, but I read, well, I didn't even read it. I plan to read a book called Plants of the Cherokee since we're working on growing an herbal, medicinal herbal garden. Oh. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot. There's a lot of learning involved in that. So who is our very interesting guest this month? Every month we have an interesting guest. This is Kathy Murray. She is a certified personal trainer. And in fact, Kathy, I have to confess the real reason I delayed this by two days, it's kind of intimidating to have a personal trainer. And I was like, no, I got to work out another 15 hours so she doesn't see me being bad. <laughs> As if she's at risk of doing it, but okay, yeah. It was like pumping weights. <laughs> um, Kathy is a certified personal trainer with over 30 years experience in the fitness industry. She's a graduate of the Ohio State University, where she was a member of the 1983 National Cheerleading Championship team. After college, she competed in and won the United States Aerobic Championship in 1986 and spent the year traveling the world as a fitness, uh, fitness ambassador and worked as a freelance educator to teach fitness to European instructors. While she was in Munich, she coached the Munich Cowboys, which is American football cheerleaders, to six national titles in cheerleading, which is pretty amazing, and was head trainer translator for the German gladiators. Oh, I was also brushing up on my German, oh. so I don't look. <laughs> okay. Mine is really rusty. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually decent at reading in several languages, but ask me to speak them. I can barely ask for a cup of coffee, even though I've literally been taking German since I was uh, four. Yeah, I used to have. Yeah, I used to have a German teacher come to our kindergarten and preschool class because oh, I lived on base in wow. Germany. So it's not like intense study or anything like that, but but it was kind of cool. So she was the head trainer translator for the German gladiators during a pilot TV show for the international gladiators. Kathy has owned her personal training fit business, Fit Bodies, for 25 years and in 2022 co-authored the Audible book, which is now in print, The Munich Cowboy Cheerleaders, 
based upon her true story of her time coaching the squad. She has released it in both paperback and ebook formats. In her spare time, she's a competitive triathlete, which she has been enjoying for 20 plus years now. She lives in Atlanta with her husband, Lutalo. I got it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Her dog, Mingus, and her cat, Sassy. Are you a jazz fan by any chance? Yes, um, I am. He is, uh, that was his second career after he's, he's a vet, but he um, started doing jazz after he retired. That's, that's your husband's second career? Yes. What does he play? He's a vocalist, jazz vocalist, traditional. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you know that instrumentalist um, have a thing about vocalists. <laughs> I'm kind of kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, the, the only correction I might offer to your intro, by the way, is I don't you think you emphasized the introductory word to Ohio State University correctly? It is the Ohio State oh, University. What did I say? Oh. Your V was just kind was, of. Yeah, so it was a little low key. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. A little low key. Set up anyway, sleeping on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so. That was an accurate you know, correction, though. Oh, yeah. right. I, I was kind of rushing and I don't know why I was rushing that intro. Sometimes I look at a lot of words and go, oh my, we only have an hour. I better talk fast. So I did. And then I said, I better slow down. So I did. What's our first strength? Our first strength is very much oriented to the title of the book, as well as this introductory reading that we have. This is called The Cheerleader. Why wouldn't it be called The Cheerleader? And so this is a little bit of a uh, variant on a mimosa. What we're going to start with is about one ounce of pomegranate juice. We're going to put these into champagne flutes because we're going to get a bit of Prosecco in there. And I have pomegranate juice flying over the place, so it looks like I'm bleeding everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to put in just a touch of some orange juice, just a half ounce, in addition to our pomegranate juice. So from a personal training standpoint, you might find that this drink actually has a small, healthy foundation to it, you know, with okay. the uh, with the fruit juice. And then, of course, we're going to put in some Prosecco. Top it off. Just about three ounces worth. And this drink is actually, it's, it's existed for quite some time as the cheerleader. Um, there have been some, one or two variants to the recipe, but it's basically some, you know, fruit juices and Prosecco. So here we have the cheerleader. All right. Cheers. I have, I have my uh, seltzer water. Excellent. <laughs> I'll toast as well. <laughs> it's a little bubbly for my taste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people would really like this on a hot day, though. Yeah, it's, it's, kind, it's of a, kind of a light drink, mm -hmm. but I'm not green. a huge fan of like even sparkling water. I'm not crazy about. So um, I think a lot of people would like it, though. So, and they're bubbly, just like cheerleaders. <laughs> right. I can see why they called it that, you know, between the kind of cheerful color and the bubbliness. Okay. So just, just out of curiosity, have you ever known an angry, grouchy cheerleader, or are they all bubbly? <laughs> We're all pretty bubbly. Yeah, they live up to the stereotype. <laughs> That's neat. We do. Hey, go ahead with the first reading. Okay. First reading. My hands are shaking. I've competed in plenty of cheerleading championships, but this one's different. For starters, I'm the coach and not the one performing. And I'm all the way in Germany, far from the comfort of the Ohio State University. <laughs> <laughs> the last place I cheered. The start time nears and I breathe deeply. The hum of the mostly German crowd growing louder. Rude school gyms are the same the world over with the usual basketball hoops and polished oak floors, this one's brighter and sharper focus somehow. The judges seem especially serious. All white, of course, more tight-lipped and formal than American judges. They're not former cheerleaders like the judges in the States. The sport is new here. Britt peeks out from the locker room door and I wave her back in. They're too green to watch other teams without it affecting their performance. It's good to be the underdog, right? We sure have plenty to prove the first cheerleading squad for the new American style football team in Munich, attempting an ambitious stunt in a decidedly American routine. It's like nothing Germany has ever seen. 
where a shaking pyramid and a cartwheel are considered advanced. No pressure. The crowd cheers and I can barely breathe as the 15 girls dash out onto the floor, hands clasped behind their backs, skirts of their black and gold uniforms flapping. A judge jots down a note as Annika leads them out. 17 years old and remarkably composed. If she's tight, they will all be. They move as one. I glance at the trophies, but quickly look away. Why do I do this to myself? Put everything on the line like this. German cameramen circle the girls as they bounce around the floor, waving to the crowd, jumping into their toe touches. I glance at the stands. It's easy if our mother and father are sitting shoulder to shoulder in a sea of white faces. There's pinched with concern. My friend Manny sits alongside them, the three of them, the only chocolate chips in the cookie. Manny wears his series look. He knows the stakes. Winning the Cram Championships means endorsements. Permanent paid position for me. Not to mention what this would mean to the team. It, will, it has become their everything. The Munich Cowboys cheerleaders mom sit in one big clique, more working class than the others. They're dressed in their black and gold colors to show support for their daughters. So different from the wealthier red satin wearing moms of the Stingers. My heart pounds as the girls spread out on the floor and stand in formation, arms at their side. They seem ready to ace it, but so many things can still go wrong. The music starts up with that amazing mashup of songs and Simone, one of the youngest at just 15, cracks a smile. She fought for this music and the risky choreography. She exchanged a glance with her friend Britt, a look that says, we can do this, but can we really? I shake my hands to, to get rid of the, the shakes. Right out of the gate, the girls are tight and the crowd senses it. If only they knew how important this is to us, the Munich Cowboys cheerleaders and how far we've come. I really enjoyed that reading. And I believe that's the opening of the book, isn't it? Yes, it is. Very opening scene and then you do a flashback. Now, when I first read this, I thought it was strictly a memoir, but some sites are calling it a novella. Is, it, is there some fiction in it? Yes, uh, the uh, we did do a composite character. Uh, okay, the character is actually Annika. Okay, and so the book was based upon her perspective and my perspective as a coach. Right. Yeah. So when you're talking about these negative things that happen in Annika's life, are those from different girls? No, that that's just through Annika, but it's pretty much, like I said, just the through her composite of her leaving okay. the national stingers and then c coming to uh, come to cheer for the Munich Cowboys. Okay. And I have to ask, you really captured those stingers as the mean girls <laughs> very well. Were they really that obnoxious? <laughs> you know, and, and, and in actuality, they were the honeybees. I just changed the name to the stingers. But yeah, <laughs> they were they are our big um, competition. Um, did, in, did they do that? Bzz? <laughs> that's awesome man that was i i couldn't stand them um so i think that's the sign of a good writer when even i was like oh, not them again Ick. was was this the first team you ever coached uh yes it was i mean i was a cheerleader and we did uh, camps you know for the summer so i coached the high school and okay. the middle school in the summer and then um uh, but this was, yeah, I kind of fell into it. They found out that I was a cheerleader. That was at the beginning of, of me getting there. So I didn't know any German. The, the manager knew no English. And she translated and said, hey, can you come to practice? So that's mm -hmm. how that that happened, where I just said, you know, I, I didn't even know they even had an American football team in Munich. Yeah, that was news to me. So I'm, you know. You learned it 30 years before I did, <laughs> so you still win. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, how, how did you get started with cheerleading yourself? Was that like something your mother did or what, what started you? You know, I actually had to go back and ask my mom because I started cheering um, at 12. I started cheering in sixth grade. I don't know. We were talking. I said, did I ask you if I could try out? Or, mm -hmm. you know, we couldn't remember, but I started cheering at in the sixth grade. 
And then I just started cheering seventh grade, eighth grade. And then I was actually teasing her last weekend because she she had me bust to another school after mm -hmm. I had made the team in ninth grade. Oh, uh-huh. I was very upset. I bet. <laughs> What, imagine. Did you get on the team in the new school? Oh, I had to wait a whole year. So I had to wait Ooh. my ninth grade year and watch their cheerleaders because even oh. though I made it at the other school, my mother was like, no, you're going to this other school. So I sat out a year. I watched them. They had a different, a, a different style than my other one. And then when I tried out in 10th grade, I made the JV. And then in football, no, that was for football. Basketball, a girl uh, quit. The team. Mm -hmm. I was the the next runner. That was the next runner up. So okay. then when I went to varsity during basketball, and then I stayed varsity and co-captain all the way through high school. Didn't make it my first year at Ohio State because because I was a we had all girls. So I was holding girls in high school. Then I mm -hmm. had to go to college and get flipped around by guys. Oh wow, that's a change. <laughs> did Did you take gymna gymnastics? I time? had to learn gymnastics. So I had okay. to start learning gymnastics because they had, you know, criteria um, okay. you had to do. So, you know, trying to learn at that age to flip around, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was how bad do you want it? <laughs> right. And, and I just have to ask this too. I was never in sports of any kind in high school. And in fact, my mother had a very negative opinion of jocks and cheerleaders and I was scared to death of them because she was always telling me how awful they were so and don't take that personally because that's not my thought that's but it's a thought I had to kind of overcome because I was I really was scared of them because I thought they were going to be mean to me and I didn't even know them you know but at the same time I would have liked to have tried cheerleading it looked like fun and you know but I was scared to, but I did do a lot of music. So I don't feel like I missed out on too much because I, I had some. We both were in marching band, which, you know, if anybody's been a marching band, that's a very serious sport all by itself. <laughs> I was a musician as well. So I played in, in the orchestra. I played clarinet. What did you play? I played clarinet, but then I was at a new high school. So they had uh, this Russian guy come in and teach me and my, uh, the other first year clarinet bassoon. Oh, oh neat. very cool. Yes. And then I played yeah. in the orchestra. So I yeah, was I played the sound for two years. Oh, um okay. yeah, trombone is my main <laughs> instrument, but I really like playing instruments. So every year I would take my mother, my grandmother had given me a lump sum of money. And so every year I would take a little bit of that, buy myself a new instrument mm -hmm. and a lesson book. And and so in eleventh grade, we had the upper and lower. Uh, bands for the 11th and 12th graders and I wanted to play bassoon the school had a bassoon so they let me take it home and learn to play it and oh, wow. and in fact I was sitting next to a couple of mean girls and they <laughs> just they would not shut up about you're not in tune and I'm like number one it's bassoon <laughs> it's, right. it's never in tune like, are they ever really in tune <laughs> and number two you know um maybe we should all just play the music. But um, one thing I really related to in this reading was, while well, I related to it only after I got to the end of the book, we find out later that your dad was very, very against you going to Germany. And he was very against you quitting your medical sales job. He was very against, you know, cheerleading by, you know. Um, and yet he flew out to see you in the championship did did something change in his heart or mind i think I, my I mother <laughs> she you know she was kind of like let her go you know at, at my my whole pitch to my dad because my dad was like you work it doesn't matter what what you know you're you're unhappy who cares you work and get your pension you're good <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so um, you know, I think, you know, he, he did finally come around, but my mom was more, let her go. I'm, I'm working. They're paying me dad. <laughs> you know, I have mm -hmm. a contract as a freelance educator. So mm -hmm. that's my safety net. I could I have my degree. I can always go back. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I think once they came over and then realized, wow, this is kind of hard. You got to pay for you got to pay to use the bathroom. You have to pay, you know, go to the laundry mat and do my clothes. I mean, it wasn't like wine and roses. 
you know, right. learn the language. And it was a whole different culture. So mm -hmm. I think that helped once they saw in real time my, like, uh, what I was able to accomplish. Um, the, right. Yeah. And, and probably what you were doing for those girls, too, because um, when you read the book and see how they went from yeah, my mom made me come to really taking pride and that's the same kind of thing that i saw being in marching band where we were it's not just playing music it's not just entertaining people you're also learning right. discipline and hard work right. and teamwork exactly. um i had an incident long story short where i got trampled by a horse the day before oh, a parade oh, oh. um i had both legs bandaged from knee to ankle one was scraped up from the sidewalk the other literally had a horseshoe imprint on, oh my, on my lower leg <laughs> and um i got a speech from the band director that at the time horrified me he said um you're marching because you came here to win this with us and i said well at least you know put the x on my gloves and shoulders so the judges will know i'm injured he's like nope no excuses you're gonna march and you're gonna do your best and we're not telling the judges anything and amazingly, they took me in for a tetanus shot that morning. So I had just gotten a tetanus shot hours before the parade. I managed to march in 102 degree heat. And uh, it was, it's not Mackinac. What's, what's the city in Michigan near Mackinac Island? Anyway, I marched in that parade 102 degree. I, I got just past the judge's stand, which was a mile down the road. And I've often said any coach or band director who did that to a kid today would probably be fired and sued yes. and yet i to this day i say he was right it was a powerful lesson mm -hmm. that we came here to do something and we're going to do it right and you know i think that you were teaching those girls exactly. a similar thing exactly. so i have to ask really quick two things before we go on to the next drink what is people's biggest obstacle in getting fit in your experience? I say as I drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the biggest is, I, excuses I hear is I don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, or they feel like like what you had talked about, I need to be in shape before I go to the gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you're there, nobody's looking at you. You know, you concentrate on, on yourself. Um, and you, you're not competing. Men are a little bit harder at that because they're looking at the guy, you know, lifting 50 pounds and they're trying to compete. <laughs> Even uh -huh. though they, you know, women are a little bit different. So I think the challenges are, um, I said, think, especially when we're older, because we've been through the PE, you know, laps and, you know, so it's like punishment, you know, get 50, you know, win sprints and run around the gym. And so they think it as that in a negative light, you know, yeah. and uh, like it was, it's a punishment. And so I just try to put a different spin on it on what it's going to add to your life. Like my mm -hmm. old seventies, eighties, I said, my responsibility is to keep you out of assisted living. And this, I see what you did there. You put a different spin on it. Did you teach spin classes? <laughs> I did. I did teach spin. <laughs> That's yeah, taught everything. Hip hop. And those were some of my favorites. Spin. You know, they had this uh, slide. Yes. So yeah, it just I just try to meet them where they are, the clients, and mm -hmm. figure out what their goals are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I also wanted to ask, as long as I have a fitness expert online, I keep seeing these ads every time I play YouTube videos about you have to burn fat, not calories. And, you know, running on a treadmill isn't going to do anything except cause you more trouble. How much of that is true? Mm. Or are they just trying to sell me a product? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you have calories in and calories out. Okay, so if you're eating more than you're burning off, you're not you're not going to make any type of of uh, of gains or whatever your goals are. If your goal is to lose weight, right? Um, the thing is, is is that you have to become you have to be active. Mm -hmm. And I, I made this little TikTok video of my mother walking at 92, three miles, mm -hmm. three times a wow. week. And the, 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 the tag, the, the line that I used, it said it was, um, we don't, 
we don't stop moving because we get old. We get old because we stop moving. Yep. You know, our grandparents and parents, they weren't sitting in front of a computer, sitting with the remote. They were outside mm -hmm. shoveling hay. They were walking to school. My grandmother lived to be 105. She said, we walked an hour to school. Wow. <laughs> you know, they had one little one school, you know, mm -hmm. one room. So when you look at how active that generation was before, they really didn't. And of course, they ate really well off the land, but they really didn't have to just diet because they ate what they right. wanted. It was nutrition. And then they went and worked. Well, and we're building up a homestead here, you know, so we're out moving every day. And that's part of our goal is to eat healthier by growing yeah. our own food. Um, so, yeah, by the time you slaughter, <laughs> raise the sheep, slaughter the feet, run up and down the hill every day to feed it, you know, it's not easy to feed yourself. Right, <laughs> you exactly. work way too hard to get fat. And you want something fresh, some salad and meat and, you know, protein. You don't want burger and fries. <laughs> right, right. Well, we did have fries. Well, <laughs> well, it was a treat. Time, but yeah. if you do have the burgers and fries, except you're burning it off. So right. I just try yeah, to you know, went down, to and go. The rabbits. And so yeah. we are ready for drink two. Oh, I'm losing track. It's been a long day. <laughs> With reading two, of course, <clears throat> there was a very obvious candidate for this drink, which was the speeding ticket. And the speeding ticket is a, uh, you know, also an, another well-known drink. And this one is a very interesting one because it starts off with creme de noyau, which is actually very hard to find. Um, so, but you can you can make it yourself with a bit of amaretto, luxardo, and cherry. So I started to, with the, uh, the the equivalent to creme de noyau. Then I put in um, some raspberry liqueur, which in this case is a Chambord. And then I go to Southern Comfort, which they ask for. Now, when I was growing up, the drinking age was much younger than it is today. And I uh, spent some time with Southern Comfort in a way that I shouldn't have. And uh, to this day, I, <laughs> I can't drink the stuff. But, um, <laughs> we're gonna make, hopefully it's well hidden enough in this drink. Uh, and I have, you know, I of course didn't waste my, my money on a big bottle. I got a very small bottle, so I won't feel so bad if I just throw it away <laughs> at the end of this. Um, and once we have our uh, wonderful liqueurs in here, we're going to top it off with four ounces of cranberry juice. That's the healthy one. Yes. And this is 100% cranberry juice. We're not going with that cranberry, cocktail, you know, or anything like that. So, you know, this drink even though it's gonna have some nice, uh, you know, alcohol and other things in it, it's gonna have ur urinary tract health <laughs> That's in it as well. So, you know, we're, we're good to go. And then we, uh, no then we top it off, you. right? Yeah, exactly, we're good to go, yes. And then we're gonna to, uh, top it off with uh, four ounces of orange juice as well. So again, we're getting some good vitamin C with our uh, adult beverage and, uh, you know, and life is good. So I put this in a shaker. And then we pour it over some ice inside of a uh, 16 ounce kind of tumbler. And again, for a summer's day with all those wonderful flavors and not too much Southern comfort. <laughs> <laughs> More for Laura, but not less. We will have something that we can enjoy. So I give you the speeding ticket. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, perfect. I like this one better. This has got some neat flavors yeah, to it. I really like this. Without the um, bubbly. Yes. So, so I might have to say this on the cover now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the truth is that Southern Comfort incident was way before he was legal, even in those years. <laughs> <laughs> Let the truth be told. This is true. So speaking of things. Well, moving right along to the second reading. <laughs> speaking of speed ticket. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. This is perfect. I rode my bike with the stream of other bikers through the busy Marian plots. The massive clock on the top of the city hall building chimed, so I was officially late. I rode faster past half, 
timbered houses, soaring churches and fountains, so different from Columbus. How nice it was to ride in a country where bicycles were a preferred mode of transportation, giving the right of way at intersections, traffic yielding to us. I rode by a woman walking along the park. Scheiße, Auslander, she called out to me. So much for learning Guten Morgen in my German class. Shit foreigner was the more common greeting I heard, but I shook it off and rode on already late for my first cowboy's practice. Since I was one of the few black women in Munich, residents felt free to protest my presence. Suddenly, blue lights flashing in my bike mirror. The bright green and white car slowed beside me and I pulled to the side of the road as other bikers sped by. This again, the officer exited his vehicle and stepped to me, pass bitte. I knew that phrase, passport please. In the past, police officers had stalled, waiting for me to realize they wanted a bribe, asking, why in such a hurry? But I never had such money to cover and hated the idea of giving in to them. I exhale, exhaled to be calm. Why did this happen when I was running late? We were all going the same speed, officer. Address. I live in the former Olympic Village, a six-month sublet. What is your destination? He asked. Are you a farmer? I looked down at my denim overalls. No, I'm going to practice hall. I gave silent thanks that cheerleading is the same word in German. You're coaching Germans? American football, the Munich Cowboys. The officer chuckled at that, a rare, rare show of German emotion. I like anyone will watch that. He handed me back my passport, apparently realizing he would not be getting a bribe. Slow down next time. I rejoined the stream of bikers and tried to shake off the irritation. Would they ever stop pulling me over for nothing? I have to ask how fast you go on, how fast you have to go on a bike to be speeding. <laughs> you don't. I was just getting, you know, I, I think at that time there were a lot of illegal Africans. Oh. People of color from other, uh, other countries. And so they would randomly pull you over because they didn't know okay. I was American until I handed them the passport. Okay. So it really wasn't about speed. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> so am I going to catch an illegal in, in the country? Okay. So it was more about an illegal immigration issue than about you being black. So he mainly wanted to know you were American. No, I think that he, well, yeah, I think he wanted to know that I had, when they look at your passports, I have my, all my proper pa papers, the per okay. permit, all that is stamped in your passport. So I am legally, I'm, I'm, I have my visa and my work permit to work there legally. Okay. So I, that's what they're looking for. You okay. Know? And, and, you know, make sure that you're legal, that you're there legally. So, right. Right. I, I, I had to to speed. <laughs> I had to kind of laugh at your comments about uh, the rare show of German emotion. It reminded me of uh, a roommate uh, years ago. In fact, well, it was 80, 88. I lived in Boston for the summer, and one of my roommates was, I always call him a seven foot tall German. He was probably more like six, five or something, but. But he was pretty tall. He was very thin. He had the stereotypical little round glasses and he was very serious. And so we went to, a, a, was it in Boston or New York? We went to a comedy club one night and it was this, you know, very, well, she was a comedian, you know, so she was loud. She was funny. She was um, extroverted. And poor Stefan was sitting in the audience. English was a second language, so he wasn't really picking up on the jokes, you know, double entendres and word plays. And he, you know, you just, you've, you've been there. It's hard yeah. in a foreign language. And so he's just looking quizzically at her most of the time. And she saw him and she started in on him, not knowing he was German not knowing this was his second language and she started in on poor Stefan. There was always oh, one in the crowd and, and he was so upset. He was like, oh. she does not know this is my second language. I do not understand <laughs> these things. Yes, I got the, the his own meme. Yeah. He kind of did. <laughs> yes. They would tell was, 
Garmin too. And I, I, I yeah, I didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, which is better than when I don't get a joke in English. <laughs> That's when it's embarrassing. I'm dying to know if you can ever go through the streets of your town muttering Scheiße aus London to yourself and see if anybody notices. You know, go, did she really just say that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it took me a while because, you know, I was just there. I, you know, I was learning all the German and I was going to school, taking, you know, tutoring lessons. But yes, that, you know, I think even with my white friends, we forget as Americans that everyone doesn't like americans mm -hmm. <laughs> we think everyone loves america well they should oh no. <laughs> well, yeah, they should but you know i i would hear some things like that from the because they can hear the accent and i would hear that from my white friends too saying oh man i got pushed today or did this yeah so some of them just didn't want any foreigners <laughs> over there well, you know and i was really curious about that because granted i was a little bit short of my sixth birthday when we left germany but i did spend the first five and a half years of my life there obviously i'm not going to see all the nuances but i don't recall my parents ever talking about germans not liking foreigners you know i and we did go into town we traveled a lot I don't remember experiencing anything like that. We had friends from town who would come on base. Um, like I said, the German teacher, of course, it was a job. You know, maybe she hated all of us <laughs> and was muttering things under her breath that we didn't right. understand. So she's just right, <laughs> right. But I've never once heard my parents say that there was an issue with Germans not liking foreigners. And I'm curious, did are they just not telling me or did attitudes change in those years? No, from no, the early 70s every german this because i met lovely uh, mm -hmm. friends uh to this day that that are german but it, there were just some i think they, like maybe like the older uh, okay it seemed like it was from old, old like really elderly people okay mean and nasty oh that's too bad but yeah. you know when I was my oldest son was born in Ireland my first husband is from Ireland and before he flew to Boston for the summer his mother warned him let's see his dad warned him if you ever marry an American I'll disown you and his uh his mother's best friend said watch your son those American girls get their hooks into our boys and they don't let go <laughs> and his mother said not my son and about three months later he's like mom i'm getting married <laughs> oh, to an american yeah. right to an american but it was very interesting when i was flying home i i kind of saw why they might not like americans i think sometimes the tourists who go there might behave a little bit differently than the american who's at home because i was standing in the line at the airport in shannon and this older man turns around and says very um patronizingly to me and i was 20 and i probably looked like i was about 15 at the time and he said very patronizingly to me is this your first time going to america <laughs> and i was like no the second <laughs> i went there when i was six <laughs> and he said oh i thought by your accent that you know and i'm like I never even talked to you you know oh, he just wow. it was the weirdest thing and then he started telling me about how he wanted to go to northern ireland and the guard asked for his passport and he told the guard you know you better let me in or i'm gonna call the u.s air force to bomb you and he's looking at me and he said and they would have too and i'm like wow so people have these you might be the reason <laughs> right. I don't know who your friends are really I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, but to you know i thought if that's how you're treating people here and he was so patronizing to me right i thought that's why people might not like americans but then my in-laws came to america they met met people who were just here and they changed their opinion <laughs> and they realized yeah, we we saw a different sort who came through and looked at us like we were part of the scenery in our cute little thatched roof houses and our cute little castles and things. So, but I found that interesting and you know very sad that mm -hmm. that that kind of thing was happening. I was curious too: did people routinely bribe the cops? Well, if you know, I I remember going riding my bike on top of the you know 
that, 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 that you had your, um, where you would park your bike and lock them up. And I went on the sidewalk and the cop was standing there and he said, that's this for Bolton. 10 marks, you know, Deutsche Mark said, uh, five marks, you can't ride your bike on the sidewalk. And I'm watching everybody ride the bike on the sidewalk. And he mm -hmm. said, I'm going to write a ticket. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, write the ticket. <laughs> but right, he wanted right. me to give him money and he wasn't gonna write no, you know, write this up. And that happened several times. But I'm just, you know, when that happened, I, I pretended like I didn't speak any German. So mm -hmm. I made them speak, try to speak English. And he kept on saying, but I'm going to write the ticket. If you don't give me five marks, I'm going to write the ticket. And I'm like, well, write the ticket. Cause I knew he wasn't going to write the ticket, but he mm -hmm. was kind of shaking me down for money. Yeah. You know, or, or someone that didn't know any better. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and give him the money. So I don't get the ticket. And, and was this just accepted practice or was this like dirty cops? I think it was dirty cops. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I have a cousin who actually had to leave his police force because he pulled on some of the dirty cops mm -hmm. and that was not appreciated. And I won't say where that police station, <laughs> that police department was. Um, how did you, you got to your first practice with this new team, not really speaking much German at all. How did you get past that language barrier? No, without Google Translate. <laughs> how um, did we survive? <laughs> I told I tell people I had on one of my social media posts I had a German English dictionary. I said this was my Google Translate. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, I I was taking some courses, but living there and having to go out every day, and I had friends that would say, you know, when I first went to Nagold before I went to Munich, there were three girls there, and they were dating soldiers, military. Mm -hmm. They would say, okay, write down every day questions. How do I ask for the bill? How do I ask for silverware? How do I order? And they would write it down and I would try to get it, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, they spoke English, as you know, they have to have English in school. So they were okay. from 15 to 20. Some, some, some girls knew there were one or there were a couple girls that could, could speak English very well and understand. So they would translate when I was okay. saying, what we're going to do today. And then the more I became, you know, your ear becomes for, they would just say to me in German, what, you know, whole paragraph. And I, and I would, could understand in, in English, oh, okay, okay, no, no, we're not going to do that today. We're going to work on the stunting today and not the gymnastics. So, but then I started saying, don't let me, you know, I have, what's, the, how do you say this in German? And then they would tell mm -hmm. me, and then I would work that into my vocab vocabulary and, and how to put the sentences together. So they were always trying to practice. And I said, I have to learn how to speak. I mean, it's not, going, you know, they have the formal, informal. It wasn't perfect. But right. I, I remember going to a tutor. And she said, your vocabulary is just, I don't understand that because I really couldn't read that great. And as I said, that was because I was always having conversational German and asking them, how do you say this in Deutsch? Okay, it's this. Okay, so now I know that means well, pyramid. It was it was more English, but certain things in German. I just learned what they were, and then mm -hmm. I literally just started with classes and going to the Volkshof Schule. I just started, and I had to practice every day because I had to go out and go to the bakery and go to the grocery store. That's living there. Right. That it came quick because mm -hmm. <laughs> you have no choice if, if you want something right. Right. Or asking and questions. It's my my daughter ran into the same thing when she went to Sweden. She's like, I want to practice my Swedish. And they would just get impatient and speak English with right. her. Exactly. So which makes it easy for the tourists, but it yeah. sure doesn't help us to learn right. languages. And so the girls, I said, you can't. And they would laugh when I would speak. And I'm like, they could put your accent it sounds so cute. <laughs> this said, is this is and you're making me feel self-conscious. No, don't laugh, you know, so that type of thing. Right. <laughs> we we were at a, a seafood place and the waitress there happened to be Russian. She was Russian, right? Yes. And um, so I was so excited. I'd been doing Russian on Duolingo so I could order this white wine <laughs> in Russian. Uh, what is it? Willow Vino, I think. Um, I... I need to brush up on the Russian again. <laughs> and she laughed. 
and and the reason I did this, I actually said so. Like, you know, an English accent sounds a certain way to us. A uh, German speaking right. English sounds we we get kind of images and ideas, or when we hear someone French speaking English. And I said, so what does an American accent speaking Russian? How does that come across to you? And she's like, I've never heard it before. Oh, it just, wow. she said, it just sounds wrong. Right. <laughs> it's like, no. it's like and she was laughing. It wasn't with her. It was, oh, it was no, out. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. They laughed. I took the Vauxhall Shule and we, they, we had Japanese, French, and everyone was trying to pronounce, uh, you know, in German. And it was so funny because the French would have, you know, and then the Japanese would go, hi. And it was so interesting when you would hear all these languages trying to speak German. Yeah, it was, it was I, really interesting. They didn't speak any English. And, you know, this was a school they would not speak. You had to just, wing, mm -hmm. you had to wing it. Um, but yeah, yeah, they would laugh because they just thought it was so cute with my accent. But I, I said, no, y'all can't laugh. I got to I got to get this. Right. I got to learn. Yeah. Still building character, probably to a German. <laughs> right, right. I think we need to move on to drink three. Okay. Well, this this was a wonderful reading. And speaking as a dad, you know, I think especially with respect to our daughters, it's like daughter comes to the put idea here. Dad goes, hmm, no, no, you didn't, you know. <laughs> and yet with a son, of course, you know, they'd go, they would just shrug their shoulders and go, well, that's their mom's DNA speaking, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or whatever. So you know what i found here was a drink called the grumpy old man because i think your, your dad in this oh. in this episode is the essence of a grumpy old man and in actuality this cocktail is somewhat famous it's been around uh for a while and it's a bourbon based cocktail with some ice in it so we'll start with that and uh the fun thing is that uh, i'm getting to use my official kentucky colonel's glasses uh, i was named a kentucky colonel not long ago and the first thing we do is we put some uh, bourbon into it, and I'm not going to use the uh, really fine bourbon, uh, given some of the other ingredients I'm going to toss into this. There's no reason to um, kill the flavor of a really decent bourbon. Um, but, uh, you know, bourbon is legitimate. It's a, you know, a great uh, alcohol to mix with. So we're going to put a couple ounces in a uh, tumbler like this or a rocks glass, and then we're going to get some lime juice, add to the bourbon. And here, it's going to be almost a full ounce. I'm not going to put exactly an ounce in uh, because I just want kind of the essence of it. Sometimes lime juice can be a little overwhelming. And then what I have is some wonderful fever tree ginger ale to uh, top this off with. So we're going to put several ounces of that on top of the bourbon and the lime juice. And, you know, it's kind of funny because when people start to talk about this recipe, they go, there's nothing grumpy at all about this cocktail. It's wonderfully refreshing and, and good, but I give you the grumpy old man. Right. Here's Cheers. The that definitely tastes much more like alcohol than yes, the first two. But the ginger ale in it is very nice. And, yeah. You know, I think it, it mixes quite well. I think the middle one is definitely my favorite. That was a really neat one. I really, I enjoyed that one. Yeah. But so, as a grumpy old man myself, I'm fairly okay <laughs> with my cocktail. <laughs> yeah, you're only grumpy when everything breaks all at the same time. It's true. Which kind yes. of defines our last month. <laughs> um, so, to reading, yeah, number three. reading number three. Okay. Grumpy old man. This was perfect. My father <laughs> came in his perfect. My father came and switched off the television. He stood there, hands on his hips. Your mother tells me you're moving to Germany to teach dancing aerobics dad. It was impossible not to feel like a kid again when Burl Murray at six feet, two inches, spoke his mind in his booming voice. Your mother and I pay for your education and this is what we get. You want to run away and be a dancer? I leave tomorrow, dad. I have an apartment and a bike lined up. A bike? You've got a brand new navy blue Ford Taurus. I turned in my company car. He shook his head. Know what I've been, I, you know what I would have given for the at, at that age? Things are different today. Are they in Germany? You think their prejudice here? He paused, scowl deepening. Where were you in sales this year? I shrugged. 
top performer. You're always the top performer, a standout employee. What about Long John Silvers? I exhaled, deep breath. That was a college job. They offered you your own location to manage. I could never do that. And my medical sales job will still be here when I get back. Will it? And I'll, they'll hire someone new. All your hard won clients will go to someone else. He paused. Is Pittsburgh the problem? Just ask for a new territory. I don't. What about your stock options? I have a feeling it will um, all turn out okay. A feeling? He squatted next to the sofa arm. These kinds of opportunities for us, for people like us, don't come along every day, Kathy. You think you could support yourself teaching Germans to dance? Aerobics and fitness, Dad. Maybe I could find some cheerleaders to coach too. He sprang up as if stung. Cheering? Girl, you need to grow up. My mother came from the kitchen and sat next to me. Maybe you're just feeling a little restless, Kathy. Barely five feet tall with a medium build and permanently kind expression. My sweet, outgoing mother, Gladys, was so different from my father. A nurse for over 30 years, she was always looking to help someone. She leaned close, releasing a light scent of evening in Paris and smoothed one hand down my back. Winning that crystal light contest changed you. After you went to Japan, traveled the world, it wasn't easy to be satisfied back here. So maybe just take a vacation, visit your sister in Florida, dad pace. It's not right for a young woman to run off like this. Can't you just be satisfied with what you have? It's my life, dad, and I wanna do something I love. Don't you love your 401k? It's just a year. He ran one hand through his hair. This is all Madonna's doing, isn't it? Technically, he was right. My friend Madonna Grimes, an international fitness star, had incredible contacts worldwide and had offered me my very first gig in Germany a year earlier. I spent my whole two weeks of vacation for medical sales there teaching aerobics. And when a full-time gig opened up, she arranged for me to go back. Madonna's my friend. Friends help each other. This isn't some evil conspiracy, just something I want to do for me, he paced. I thought you were better than this stupidity. I breathed deep. It's not stupid. That job won't be here when you get back. I stepped toward the kitchen, ready to be anywhere but there. I'll take that chance. I have to say, speaking as a dad of a daughter, I loved how the argument there was completely no win for you. No matter which avenue you went, you went down, you were never going to get out of there. You know, it's like, Dad, I won the Nobel Prize. You know, those medals are gold plated. You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he was. He you was, know, I <laughs> I loved this reading both because we saw at the beginning that he really came around, but also, oh my gosh, it's like you were watching my conversation with my dad and changed a couple names. We had my my degree is in music and what what did your dad do for a living? He was, you know, my dad had worked um warehouse jobs, you know, grew up in the country, but really didn't even have a high school degree. Okay. So he had to work jobs and he had to take what he could to support the family. So that's mm -hmm. why you work. You don't you don't have to be happy because he never had that choice. Right. Right. See, I would have assumed from the way he was talking to you that he was somewhat like my dad, who was a military officer. And um, so when you've got a military officer and his daughter says, I'm going to major in music, that's when fireworks start happening and not not the good kind. Um, like, you can't do that. That's stupid. You know, he probably did use that word and you can't make a living at that and you you can't do this and you can't do that. And I'm like, you're telling me I'm going to college. You're telling me I'm paying for the degree. If I'm buying it, I'm buying what I want. Right. And, you know, it, it did work out well. And I love the fact that you said, I want to do something I love. Because I always told my kids, now it backfired on me in the end, but I always told my kids, if you do a job you love, you never work a day in your life. So, and, and that's the way I felt, you know, I'd go in to teach music lessons and be like, my gosh, I'm the luckiest person in the world. They're actually paying me really good money to sit here with kids and play twinkle, twinkle, little star. 
Um, and I bet you feel the same way, I you know, the same way. I love teaching. I love educating. So I would do the big conventions on the weekend, teaching their instructors. They had a, a instructors. They had a um, certification program because they knew nothing about fitness. So, yes, it was just my it was just my calling and it was my passion. Right. And, and, and calling is the word. You know, so the, the way this backfired on me is kind of a funny story. One day I, I have nine kids. And so that's that's a lot of lights. Wow. Left the- <laughs> she has 10 with my daughter. Yes, yes. with his daughter. We I put have her in 10. a double digit. Um, wow. So with nine kids, lights were on all over the house all the time. And I kept, you know, use your words, please turn off the lights, kids. And it wasn't working. And one day I'm like, turn off the lights. I work hard for this money. And one of my boys says, you love your job. You never work a day in your life. Mm. <laughs> like turn off the lights anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Forget that part. So, yeah. um, you know, your friend Madonna Grimes. Yeah. She sounds like a really interesting person. How, do you want to tell our, our audience of 9.10 million something yeah. about Plus her? Plus or minus. Yeah. A few. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and how did you know her? We met in college. She okay. was, um, we were both cheerleaders. I cheered after I started, I stopped cheering and started teaching aerobics at, at the Ohio okay. State University. And she, we just became really good friends. And she was actually a dancer. And okay. She, and when, she, and so once we, um, my roommate, who got me into aerobics, um, after I stopped cheerleading, Madonna went to to NYU to get her master's in dance. Okay. She's the one that saw the aerobic competition. Said, you guys, it's in Shape Magazine. We should enter this. Judy and I were living together. And then uh, Madonna was in New York. And so she said, hey, let's do this competition. So fast forward, we win the national uh, aerobic, we get on the national aerobic team, we travel. But then I I couldn't make, you know, that's not a serious job as my parents were telling me. Now, right. once you finish with the thing, now you have to use your degree. That's when I started pursuing sales after I came off the Crystal Light uh, okay. championship. So Madonna just became this international star. She went to Japan. She had her own clothing line. And she, I remember her saying, we need instructors in Japan initially. And she said, I, can you come for a month? Well, my supervisor laughed. <laughs> She's like, you're not coming out of your chair for a month. So that's when I told Madonna, if you give me two weeks, I can go and take vacation. Mm-hmm. And so she had Germany and Italy. So um, that's how I went over there as a national aerobic champion, taught master classes. And then one of the gyms were only hiring Americans to come in. That's when I first went to Nagold. And that's how I got the contract. Madonna said, hey, they're they're given six month contract, which I extended for 10 10 months. And then I moved Mm -hmm. to Munich. And then six months turned into five years. (laughs) Yeah, well, that was the question. I, I was curious how long it ended up being that you were in Germany. We are at the point where we need to wrap up with links so that I can fit this into one po- podcast, but then we can stay and talk. I'd, I'd love to hear more about this. So where can people find you online? Okay. My website is fit, F as in Frank, I-T hyphen bodies, B-O-D-I-E-S dot net. So all my Instagram and uh, Facebook uh, is, is all on that. Kathy Murray, you can find me on Facebook as well. Um, so yeah, the, the book, you can order the book, all the books on my website as well. So fit-bodies.net. Fantastic. And so what about your life? I, I am at lauravosika.com, V as in Victor, O-S-I-K-A. Uh, Chris and I are at glenmerrillfarms.wordpress.com. Glenn Merrill is two R's, G-L-E-N-M-I-R-R-I-L, farms. If you can't spell farms, I'm not even going to try and help you. Um, <laughs> um, if you want to see our lovely sheep and our lovely rabbits and our herb garden, um, we are, well, we are booksandbrews.net, Michael Agnew and I. And you can find all our past guests there. He's the normal co-host. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Michael does beer. Chris does cocktails. 
Um, and we are sponsored this month by gabrielsforenbooks.com. And most of these, you can some of them you can find at Twitter and various places. Uh, do you have any upcoming public events, Kathy? You know, I'm actually in the process of putting together book signing uh, here in Atlanta. Fantastic. So on my website as well. So okay. we're the beginning stages. So I'm excited. I mean, this is, everybody has been so great. I mean, everyone loves a true story. And, and even when I reun reunited with the cheerleaders, you know, they were kids, you know, and um, now they're like, you know, professionals and wives and mothers. Yes. And every championship I had a mantra, pain is only temporary. Together each achieves more, that's T. This is how you mm -hmm. become a champion. And it was, I was blown away because you know, they're teenagers. You don't think nothing. Right. Different. And they were like, I still use team with my, with my group, and, you know, that's great kids to do this. And I, I just was blown away that they still are using yep. these things that I taught. Well, but like I said about my band director, you know, that's these lessons stick with us for life. Really? You know? It's Absolutely. like, I can't believe how long ago high school was for me. And it seems like I've blinked and, you know, <laughs> well, three weeks. Three weeks. Laura, do yeah, you have any upcoming events? I do. Uh, I will be at the Southern <laughs> Festival of Books in Nashville, October 26th and 27th. So readers can find me there. And Gabriel's Horn is accepting submissions for its two new poetry anthologies, which are on the themes of music and faith. Which I've already contributed to. <laughs> and so I'm going to go out on a limb here, Laura, and think that we perhaps have an interesting guest next month as well. I say Ooh, it every lady. month, and every month it's true. I'm <laughs> really excited about next month's guest. Um, Stephen Downs is an Irish contemporary poet and novelist, so we'll be hearing a nice accent next month. Not that yours isn't. <laughs> Not that ours isn't. Um, we have wonderful accents. Um, yeah, you betcha. Yeah. <laughs> We just moved from Minnesota, so yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, Steve holds a degree in classical history, so I'm excited about that, and a master's in cultural anthropology. His latest books are Fire and Stone and The Italian Lady. He is a published poet since 1996. His first novel was published in 2013. And he has a number of novels out in various genres, and he has also published three children's books. So that should I should see if there's a second page. No, there is. <laughs> this is funny. I keep accidentally printing my notes oh, on yeah. the back of our, our check stock for the farm. Right. Yeah, I have to select tray two, and sometimes I forget, or I don't know he put the check paper in there again. <laughs> So this has been Books and Brews, episode 64C. Cheers. Cheers. Right, thank you.